what this seeks to do really is expand the idea of revolution to not only look at other social phenomena but also look at uh, things that we see in the natural world. One that always occupies me is the origin of life. That is a revolution. Um, and also the uh, the change from being hunter-gatherers to being in one place, the Neolithic, as a revolution. That was definitely a revolution. And it changed things so p fantastically. Really big changes followed that. But they don't see it as a social uh, revolution. And it, that's all it was. Now, there'd be all sorts of social relationships that had never, ever occurred before and completely it, new. It was really, I mean, we can think of it in terms of it being the crucial emergence that unlocked the rest of human development, Absolutely. unlocked the emergence of civilization as we know it. Without that Neolithic revolution, there would be no towns and cities and no, everything. No, there wasn't. There, there was nothing. There was nothing before the Neolithic revolution. And I think that's the that's what makes it an emergence. You, the, the evidence for the emergence is not the newness that happened afterwards, but the nothing that happened before it. So this isn't some gradual evolution of ideas this is a sudden event nothing for thousands of years and then suddenly bam everything happens so revolutions are really uh unstoppable really when they're natural it's uh it gets difficult when you're talking about people because <laughs> we're active agents in it's the, yeah, yeah, you've got active agents against as well as uh, active agents for, and uh, power become, becomes part of it. I mean, I'm sure there were piles of people in Germany who didn't want Hitler, but they didn't have any chance of doing a damn thing about it, did they? threshold where huge upheaval is, is unavoidable you can't you can't go back and I guess that happens in that sort of almost avalanche of change happens in natural systems as well as social systems you'd probably find that there's a pile of natural revolutions that we uh, aren't aware of looking at it from now but you know, you know Take, for instance, the one that I always like to say, language. I'd say that language didn't develop until uh, people were living together in villages and, and so on. When there were hunter-gatherers, you wouldn't get much development in language. But once they were in one place uh, and you met people lots of times, probably every day sort of thing, language then developed and you'd get a revolution in language it had uh, the vocabulary would go up a colossal at a colossal rate it had become quite a different tool in a way you might say that you know if we're saying a prior system has to collapse before a new system emerges that's that's the kind of model of an emergence which we see echoed in in social revolutions you could say a similar thing must have had to have happened in, in language where yeah. lots and lot a system of uh, where people had local languages had to collapse before well, we got things like the, nations we couldn't have that, a nation where every village has a different language yeah that surely did happen and does happen i mean one of the things that uh, you notice about uh, uh, immigrants is that most of the young immigrants speak english so the uh, if they were just uh, uh, one family in among uh, lots of others of, of their uh, ethnic background, they could perhaps carry on speaking their own language. But when, but, but when they're um, uh, in, in an in milieu where, where the dominant is, 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 is a different language from the one that they were taught, 
Is every chance that there'll be these catastrophic changes, undermining of the old and, you know, bringing in of the new? There's a relationship between language and power as well, where uh, conquering forces, new ruling classes being imposed upon a population will change the language of the country. Yes. I mean, and in one of the interesting things that's come out recent from recent research is that languages will cross continents rather than people. So this idea of these migrations, there's no actual evidence that huge numbers of people made that trip, but the language made the, the trip. The language did, yeah. And, that, that's, and uh, you'll get, for example, um, a new ruling class in Britain when the Normans invaded and French becoming part of the language. Because a very important part be, as well. Yeah, well, it becomes the, 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 the language of the ruling class is always the language of law and the language that uh, is used to control people. <laughs> so um, they'll become the dominant languages and you'll get situations like you do in Wales where the, in the south uh, where you've got the, the biggest sort of working class Welsh population, they all speak English and no yeah. one speaks Welsh. Yeah, they, when because was, the, uh, the colonialism did its job. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the case, all right. There was someone who was doing research into language and do you know where literally all the languages of the earth started? Well, yeah, Anatolia is Turkey. Yeah. And it was from Turkey that the languages went to India, right? And also came west. And nearly all the languages, you'd be amazed how many of them are all related. And, and the, the one that proved it was the word for father. And they're all very, very similar right across the world. Religions tend to ossify a language. Like Latin. Uh, yeah, Latin is a good example with the Catholic Church. Um, it, it, you get a lot of that going on. And it, you will get a religion in some part of the world. And if you ask people what various rituals mean, they don't know. But they know the ritual, and it, it's a remnant. <laughs> it's a remnant from the past, uh, which which they don't know the reason for. They, they know when you use it and how important it is, but why they don't really know. It'd be interesting to look at how rituals like that are are a force for conserving the status quo beyond that example. So generally there are pretty fundamental sort of political reasons for not talking about revolution in in the way we study things and it's, it's not talked about it's not, it's not no it never is because no. and that that's a kind of example of a sort of soft power exercised by those who who control what's taught in schools and universities and the rest of it just think how different it would be if in school you actually got discussions about revolution the school's actually a very ritual based uh it's quite they're quite conservative places really i mean oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because it's about it's about controlling how the next generation is going to act and, and keep the current system going it's a big part of the school's play is an institutionalization of that uh, I don't think it's overt, but I think it's always there in the background, um, down to sort of the higher the power hierarchies that happen within schools, uh, mimic those in society. You don't get democratic schools, do you? No, you certainly don't. Um, it, the one exception to this is that you can get higher education that can be radical. Hmm? Uh, and I, I've noticed it in my life. Uh, there's been times when the most radical place has been in the universities, not not among the working class. Um, even in the famous one, 1968 in France, the, uh, the rebellion in Paris against the Gaulle was led by students, mm -hmm. not by the working class. But but what they did, the students actually went to the Renault factory and uh, and uh, got them to come out. Uh, but the workers didn't start it, the students started it. I think that's one of the reasons why 
uh, far right activity, which is which is often there to stop things like that happening, will often have an anti-intellectual um, yeah, it's often it bent. It will be anti-universities. I mean, and you can see this even in things like the Brexit debate and in Trump, where they're saying, "Oh, you can't trust the experts." And, <laughs> You know, um, you can't trust statistics, you can't trust researchers, you can't trust, you know, anyone, really. <laughs> and that's actually very convenient for the, for the far right and for those who want to maintain the economic status quo as it is, which is what far right activity is generally about, isn't it, at the economic level. It's about stopping um, revolutions, it's about stopping... Um, oppressed people rising up that's what fascism is for isn't it yes of course it is in fact it, it's a measure of crisis when fascism comes to the fore yeah um it doesn't come to the fore during periods of prosperity that's for sure it comes to the fore during periods where things the bottom's falling out of things mm. it uh, very successfully divides those who should be united against common enemy which is their class oppressors yes. because uh, if you've got people you know squabbling over issues of race and identity they're not really tackling the real economic concerns which are actually affecting their lives which is the fact that they're fundamentally exploited if you can drum up nationalism and find a, a bogeyman do you know something that I've got to inter intervene here the, the thing that I'm most annoyed at in left-wing politics is how fucking anti-intellectual it is. Mm -hmm. No, really. And I've been in it don't, since I was 19. Uh, you don't get education, really. In trade unions, in political... You were in political parties, weren't you? I was in several different political parties. Mm -hmm. You just don't get it. They don't do it. It's mostly to do with uh, activism. But not understanding. Uh, it, it's rabble rousing, you know, rhetor rhetoric and all this, you know, to do that. But as to uh, equipping people to understand, no. Not at all. Yeah, I guess uh, one of the other things that we've, we've talked about before is that um, Marxism kind of ossified, and one of the reasons why it didn't get pushed any further and the theory didn't advance is that it was never um, reconciled with science in the way that it needed to be in the 19th century so uh, and science suffered uh, for the same reasons because that, that that intellectual revolution didn't happen basically no that's right it didn't it didn't happen and it should have happened and, and, and the I think the interesting thing is there was a moment I can't remember exactly what year it was. It was probably something like um, 1910, something like that, uh, when there were various people in the Bolshevik Party who, who were going for Poincaré and Marx's uh, imperial criticism. And Lenin wrote a book to stop them, and he succeeded. But no one took it any further. Lenin didn't, and nobody else did. So the, to, it, it, that was the last moment as that I can see where a political party uh, was doing a philosophical thing that was important. That's the last moment. I can't think of any thereafter that did that. Not even in, um, in Russia after the revolution. Because it, was a, it was a funny old place. It actually took the land off the landowners but gave it as private property to the peasants. And then later on, it was taken back from the peasants and forced collectivization. Mm. That, that wasn't a good plot, was it? <laughs> By any measure of means. Uh, but it, it's what happened. Um, I don't even know that they really knew uh, that they could have a revolution. I think it just because of the war and, and the cataclysmic collapse of the of uh, the Russian military, it just became an opportunity and was grasped by a very very vigorous party, the Bolsheviks.
Is actually a symptom of, of the collapse of an economic system anyway. Revolutions following world wars from a sort of Marxist emergent way of looking at things is maybe what you'd expect to happen because the world war is the calamity mm. of the system collapsing prior to the new system emerging. I mean you even got it to a lesser extent after World War Two. Yes you did. With the um, you know the Labour election in Britain um, probably some of the most left-wing things that have ever happened in a sort of... The Chinese Revolution was in the 40s. Mm. And I have a distinct suspicion that so was the Korean, the Vietnamese, <laughs> or at least soon after. The problem you've got, if you sort of take this kind of argument to its logical conclusion, that systems must collapse completely before new systems emerge, what you get out of that is what a lot of the accelerationist type leftists say you know so you get someone like Zizek for example saying the best thing that for the left-wing movement is for someone like Trump to come along <laughs> because it's accelerating the destruction of nations. that's stupid that's just stupid it's like saying that the best thing for the revolution was Hitler was he? accelerationists might say Hitler is a logical conclusion of of the system collapsing. But is the reaction of the ruling class? Yes. See, one of the things that people forget is that, that the Nazis weren't just a little group that grew big. No. They were, they were a group that, that found their money and resources from, from the capitalist class. They became a unity. Did you know, for instance, that the, uh, the woman who owns BMW, did you know this? The woman who owns BMW now, her family were the biggest supporters of the Nazis in Germany. Her family. And they're still around now. ways in which right-wingers attempt to whitewash history about this is they will try and link things like Mussolini to left-wing movements or they'll say oh well it was the National Socialist Party when they're talking about Hitler and it's, it's, a, it's a deliberate attempt to separate capitalism from fascism and make fascism look like it's similar to Stalin and things no, like no, that. No, 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 no. Fa fascism is very, very linked to capitalism. Of course. But there, there is a deliberate attempt by right-wingers to, to remove that from historical understanding of what happened. I think it, it's another one of the many weapons in the artillery of the system that exists now in order to put down, tarnish, mudslinging. Oh, mudslinging. Mudslinging. They're, they're, all of these attempts, are different, and they work, uh, of ways of maintaining the status quo. They're, they're a part of the, the policeman processes, really, yes, yeah. culturally, of the system that exists.
look at the mudslinging that's going on with Corbyn. Like, yes, oh, it's, it's getting it's, worse by the day. It's absolutely insane. Uh, and they get away with it. And I think one of the interesting things about, op, you know, we're talking about opportunism. There's the opportunism of the of the people in charge as well as the opportunism of people taking advantage of calamity to to instigate revolutions, but. The, the opportunism of, of a situation like Israel, where they can use the language of the left, uh, anti-racism language, in order to defend a fundamentally a racist. racist state, <laughs> a racist an state. ethno state, really. Yeah. I mean, how you can use racism to defend Israel and, and not uh, and not have serious cognitive dissonance about it beggars belief to me. Yes. I mean, if you've got a, if you've got a, a country that is segregated by race, yeah. and you're using and you and use accusations of racism to, to defend it, I just I don't even understand how that logically works. But well, it doesn't logically they pull work. Pull it off though. You start with where you want to go, and you fit arguments to it. It's nothing to do with a a reasoned case, is it? It's not a reasoned case, but it it, it obviously works somehow. I mean, it's, it started happening in America as well, where Trump has, uh, you know, there's these four Democratic Congress women. Yes, these women. Who are, who, you know, are much further left than America's used to. Um, not that they're socialists, really, but they're further left than America's used to. And they're all guns out for them. Yes. Seriously, they, yes. they want them destroyed. <laughs> and uh, one of the things that they, because two of them are, either Muslim or they're from that part of the world originally ethnically um, that he's Trump is ramping up this anti-Semitic narrative against them um, with no real evidence they don't, like you said they don't, they don't need logic or evidence they, they just they need to repeat, repeat the same lie enough it, time it, it's, um, it's how you con people with lies that's what it is I mean if enough people shout it from enough platforms mm. Uh, on the radio, TV, newspapers, everywhere. It's just an easy solution to most people who don't think. I think the the interesting thing is in, in an age with the internet where supposedly media has been, is more democratic, anyone can create media now. Social networks allow anyone to share content. Surely this should have resulted in less control for the powers would be, but it's actually been the opposite case. So there's a bit of a contradiction, dialectical thing to kind it's of investigate. It's interesting what there. that has been, though. What they've done, the capitalists, in uh, in um, on the internet, is they've made the sort of thing that people like, like Facebook and so on, which looked as though it was just a democratic, everybody has as a say. But the way they've used it and then put adverts in and all sorts of things, they've changed its nature. It's mm. become something else. So that's really, that's really, if we're talking about the evolution of revolution, <laughs> if we're talking about how um, things have changed since the great revolutions of the 20th century and, and how a revolution might happen now, we've got to start picking apart how these digital tools are being used against us as well as how they might be used for us. I think that's absolutely imperative, yeah. And I don't because, because if you take, for instance, the trajectory from uh, just in the last eight years, from the Arab Spring, do you remember? Now the Arab Spring was fueled by uh, social media, but it was also stopped getting too far, and sometimes turned into its opposite. Now even even Egypt, which is a big, big country with lots of people, um, and I followed it in detail, and that reached a peak. And where is it now? He's died, you know, Morsi, did you know? Yeah. The elected uh, president, actually legally elected president, was removed by the elite, the army leader and jailed, and he was in jail for years, and now he's died. I mean, it's not that I'm in favour of the Muslim Brotherhood, but he was the bloody proper, proper president, there's very little doubt about that. 
If you're going to say that you're for democracy, you've got to say he was a proper peasant. I think, you know, economically at least, he was to the left of, of uh, all other administrations. He wasn't socially. So you've got, you had a very socially conservative view of things, particularly in terms of things like women's rights. Yeah. That was wrapped up in um, an Islamic idea that wealth should be shared. So um, that was dangerous to the liberals on both fronts. It removed their liberal freedoms, where they could, you know, have sex with who they wanted and <laughs> swan around in fancy cars and be more Western, I guess, in how they behaved. Uh, but it also threatened them economically because they were the m upper middle class of Egypt. Yeah. They had money. They want. They didn't want it to be shared amongst the peasantry. They did not. So uh, Morsi was an odd combination in that he was he might he was right wing socially, but he was he was more left wing economically, and those two things were both a threat to a lot of the people that actually you know originally initiated the revolution because it was at, f at first a bourgeois revolution. I remember when the uh, the the middle class that were rebelling. We're in that square, um, Tahrir Square, and uh, and the the Muslims decided to bring ordinary people in, and a very silent procession of thousands and thousands of peasants. Did you did you see that? Mm. Came in. They weren't. Uh, I've got slogans, placards. They were quiet, and they just wove in. And came in an almost endless pile of peasants that the Muslims had brought in, and that was the end, really. Mm. That was the end. The, the, the middle class uh, revolutionaries, if you want to call them that, didn't know what to do about it because these were definitely the majority of Egyptians that were pouring on that silent march with no placards, no chants. Dear me. I said that's an interesting thing about revolutions that's not really studied either in the fact that the a huge percentage of revolutions um, were what we might call capitalist revolutions so they were revolutions where a growing middle class wanted to overthrow a ruling that's class. right yeah uh, you know the English Civil War, French Was Revolution, yeah. loads French of as well. and, and the re most of the revolu the revolutions of the twenty first century were actually of that. They weren't like the Russian Revolution. So, but in, all, in a lot of those revolutions, what the, the middle class need to do for it to be a success is recruit the peasantry and the working class to the cause. And then betray them. So, and then betray them, yeah. <laughs> so you've got, like, in the French Revolution, you know, Egalité, Fraternité, you know, to oh, trying to drum cool. up a, a, a mass support for the revolution. Um, but re the reason why the Egyptian revolution failed is they didn't do that. No. They, the middle class failed to recruit the, work, the, the workers completely. Yes. And the workers voted for Morsi. They didn't try. The, vocus, the, vo the, 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 the vast majority of Egyptians um, who live in poverty voted for Morsi because yes. the Muslim Brotherhood had done more than the state to help people in poverty. And it had. It had done more than the state. What we're short of in understanding the dynamics of things like revolutions is insufficient data. We know quite a bit about the French Revolution, okay? And we know, you know, things from Mark. But you've got 700 not there. And they're all at different levels and they all have different qualities of information and they'll all help to understand the dynamics of these things. The problem, you know, they always say history is written by the victors. Yes. And what you've got here are 700 
rebellions in history, the vast majority of which were failures. Were failures. And so how that is then recorded, written down, talked about, is skewed by the fact that the ruling class won again. Yes. Um, and so it's not part of history as taught, it's not how we understand, um, it's not really even how Marxists understand class struggle, I don't think. Um, so I think it's really interesting to see this list because it seems to fly in the face of our historical understanding of ourselves. Yeah, and and it's, 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 so, it's so so vast, it, it, you know, when you told me the figures, I was flabbergasted. Because I could tell you a few revolutions that occurred, but not that many. Seven hundred odd? I mean, it, the list does feature everything from sort of small rebellions, uh, sort of village and town scale, to nationwide events. So it is everything. But, but, one thing about uh, holism, is that it does try and cover all the different levels. It's about qualitative change. Now maybe there's more to it if you get deeper into it. But at this stage, all qualitative changes, and that's all of these, every single one of them would fit in with something happening that flipped into a new mode, wouldn't it? It'd have to, for it to even happen. So they'd all be important. I mean, I reckon you get emergencies in day-to-day -day life, but they're very low level, they're, you know, they're just in your effort of, of today sort of thing. But they'll happen at every level, from things like that to state revolutions. And not, oh. ju not just state, not just uh, state revolutions where uh, a government is successfully overthrown, but in the kind of macro level revolutions where entire economic systems well, that's uh, even are brought down. And I think it would be interesting to see that there are different levels of revolution, different levels of emergence that need to be considered and, and the relationships between them. Is it, you know, do, do you get a kind of avalanche point where, in, where if there's enough smaller rebellions, it builds up to a momentum where something big does happen, something really big? I think one of the more important things about this is that you've put a finger on the only place where you're likely to get data because most emergencies are either too fast, they're lightning fast, or they're very, very slow over eons. So when we're talking but in, about... But in social revolutions, they're at a speed which we can look at. As, a, as opposed to what, we, what we've been talking about with revolutions that happen in nature, because they're happening at time scales That's right. that we find difficult to deal with. Well, well impossible, really. And most of them are hidden. You know, you, we just don't know the detail. But the thing about social revolutions is that and that, of course, is why it had such an impact, I think, on Marx. He realised how important his subject, history, was for understanding qualitative change. The most important place. But unfortunately, that research was never taken and expanded beyond the social. No, it wasn't. Which is a damn shame, isn't it? And, and, and even now in what I'm doing, which is nothing to do with social change, it's to do with uh, scientific method, uh, I'm finding things now that were never found since Marx, because Marx never got around to doing science. But there's, there's a lot of areas, I'm pretty sure, where there's data which will qualify and improve and develop this idea of what the dynamics are of such changes. I think we're pretty ignorant, you know. Mm. Um, we don't really know enough. I think one of the things that we need to study more um, is what you've called before policeman processes. They're not just policeman processes in the obvious sense where uh, state apparatus are used to put down uh, a rebellion, but policeman processes as a part of natural revolution yes. where systems are self-maintaining. Yes. And that we can understand all sorts of different things that happen both politically and naturally as forms of policeman processes. I've been getting an idea about this. It's only the beginnings of an idea. You know, I talk about a balanced stability. Mm. But I've just recently started thinking a bit more about that. The balanced stability in itself is a policeman. Mm. Because when something happens and it causes a change one way, the very balance pushes back and maintains the situation. So the maintenance of a balanced stability, which you might think would be, you know, like a policeman process in society, 
A lot of it is just due to the fact that it's a balance between contentions. And the contentions can be both ways. You can have a contention coming from ordinary people and then you can have a contention coming from the state. But it could also be from anywhere as long as they're part of a balanced stability. So, so there is an aspect of policing processes that's just built in. I, th- I think that's it. I think that it, its built inness is why we don't always understand what's happening. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, the, there's a you know the conspiracy theory type leftist will see the fact will see this always as a conscious thing. That's oh, right. that they're doing this for this reason. And, but actually, a that's lot, just simplifying it. Though, but I, I think it's because we're not really seeing this as a form, no, as no. natural processes. We're talking about natural revolution. These are natural counter revolution, and they they come out spontaneously out of systems um, without there needing to be conscious intention of it. I mean, people are just responding to it, to any to any given situation in a way that seems natural to them. So when people go on the defensive, or they adopt a certain method, or a certain kind of propaganda is circulated, or um, or the like, you know, like this anti-Semitism thing has proven a very useful form of policeman process. But yeah. I don't think it was ever really intentional. They, there's an opportunism there, and there's yes, a yes. there's a took advantage. Yeah, yeah, but they, and it's more a kind of pragmatism of the system. And even and even. Reactionary ideas within ordinary people mm. can, can be a part of this. But aren't, aren't reactionary ideas by ordinary people a, a, a kind of what Althus have called it interpolation, where people, because they're brought up by the system, yeah. are really characterised by the system. That's so right. they will respond in ways that the system um, has told them to. That's really. Absolutely. So um, people's prejudices have been programmed by their upbringings by the the state of things as they are and so people are self-oppressing they'll roll out these prejudices and their effective policeman process again non-intentional no one from up high is going no that's right it just and, and, I'll, and i'll give you another example of that people's uh what's the word inferiority complex people think i I I can't do this. I'm, I'm not good enough to do this. Uh, I can't understand it. Uh, and that's 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 a little different from what you're saying. You get people acting against uh, um, something that you're trying to do, which is revolutionary, because they don't trust themselves to do it, and they don't trust you to do it. You know what I mean? That's different. That's not uh, built-in uh, things from the powers that be. That's uh, feelings of inadequacy can do that. And a natural defensiveness yeah. of saying, well, Absolutely. I... Absolutely, and know. that does happen. I've come across it many, many, many times. But that's, again, that's a kind of... It's a natural policeman process where um, systems are self-steadying because all of the people involved in it want to maintain things largely as they are because, because of fear, of the, fear of the unknown. That's safer than the unknown. Yeah, yeah that's true, it's yeah. true, that. Um, so we've looked at emergencies of various kinds, uh, revolutions really that happen in the natural world, things such as the origin of life, perhaps even the Big Bang. And we've looked at social revolutions and how they seem to be almost a, a natural part of, of human development, a very recurring feature in history. And we've, uh, we've talked before about how the new system always comes from a total collapse of a prior stability, often a result of internal contradictions finally playing out. So we've done, this is all really fascinating sort of theory on on what revolutions are and and where they take place. But I guess the real question now is is how do we use it? Um, In the infamous words of Lenin, what is to be done? Well, that that, that is the big question. Mm. And the trouble is that at one time, he, we knew what to do because there was a labor movement with uh, workers in trade unions organized in factories 
fighting for class uh, positions against the, uh, the ruling class, the capitalist class. But now that those structures of the working class are gone. So it's not, not as easy as it used to be. Um, in fact, uh, most of the actions that seem to take place are not directly and obviously class actions. There seem to be actions defending women's rights or uh, immigrants or anti-racism or something like that. The only way forward is to politicize those actions that do happen. But you've got to have a, you've got to know what you're fighting for and you've got to have a, a vision of a, a different future from what we have now. I guess in a lot of the 20th century, people were thinking about preparing for and very much expecting that collapse of capitalism to happen. And, and one of the things, you know, alongside the sort of collapse, the fall of the Soviet Union and the, the sort of persistent question of why hasn't capitalism collapsed yet, um, it kind of haunts the whole subject really. Um, I mean, this is something that was predicted in the 19th century that would happen, and it, we're well into the 21st now. But I think I think the reason is because the left isn't good enough. Mm. Well, that's I mean, that's a reason for there's not to not to know what happens when it does. But if 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 capitalism is is going to collapse under its own weight, so to speak, if that's if that's how uh, these emergencies happen. Capitalism should collapse whether or not we're ready for it. The thing is that when we're talking about emergencies, natural emergencies and social emergencies, they're different. Mm. Because we've got an active enemy working for us to fail. Uh, now, when you're talking about uh, uh, such things in, in nature, you know, with the emergence of life and the emergence of uh, consciousness and so on, there wasn't something stopping you doing that. But now there is definitely an organized and powerful and very, very rich enemy that is working against you. If we're, if we're applying those ideas to sort of emergence theory, I guess what we've seen is a very adaptable set of policemen processes, I guess, yes. that have worked endlessly to try and subdue those internal contradictions in capitalism you know they're constantly shoring it up they're constantly making sure that those contradictions never come to the fore but we do have the advantage that they can't do it forever because the contradictions are real uh, and what's happening in the latter period is so uh, extreme with most of the wealth being concentrated in just a few percent of the world's population and the vast majority of the world's population getting poorer, it's not sustainable. How are we going to have it? it? There was a sustainability when there were unions because they fought for wages for the working class and that meant that the working class could buy things. <laughs> but now, because the working class are getting poorer all the time, they're not even in a position to buy their own house, say. I suppose one of the ways that they've countered that is is globalization when you've got the whole world involved in this system you know it's a very big and heterogeneous system so there'll be parts of it that are doing well while other parts of it are not doing so well they, they may well get a shrinking middle class in one area but you may well have a growing middle class in another area so globalization has been a, a, probably the key thing that has happened in the last 50 years that capitalism has done to try and resolve those contradictions. I think globalization was the important thing from the 70s onwards. But what saved capitalism in the 21st century was China. Mm. And China is supposed to be a people's republic. It's supposed to be communist. It's supposed to be communist, but it isn't, it's capitalist. But it was the vast expanse of capitalism in China that saved things. In spite of having the uh, the big slump in 2008, uh, China 
spent colossal amounts of money on superstructure and town city building and so on uh, to actually counter the effect of the slum and to a certain extent resolved it. I think another interesting dialectical contradiction in there as well which I find fascinating is the fact that the best way to counter class consciousness was actually state communism because the consciousness of the people was rigorously controlled by a one-party state. So weirdly or not enough, I mean I teach Chinese students at, at university and they have less class consciousness coming from a communist state than the students from Britain. No, I'm not surprised, I think you're right. So that, that's a really interesting dialectical contradiction there, that the very thing that comes that is supposed to give class consciousness is well, it's, ossified it's, it's form expensive. It's gone full circle because it's now running the most efficient capitalist country in the world. Well, it's, it's the workshop of the world. The workshop of the world. Yeah. It's the second most powerful uh, economic power in the world. And could well overtake the US. Will overtake the US. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think this is, this is the thing. It, it's, you know, just looking back over human history and everything we know about the evolution of nature is all systems at some point will come to an end that's just what happens and capitalism is no different um, it's been going a few hundred years um, and we don't know exactly when it's going to completely run out of steam but it will the thing that's that, that we're not sure about and we used to be more sure about I think as Marxists was what's going to happen after that do you, do you know what I think is, is the important uh, lesson from history? Is that when you got um, breakdowns of previous systems, it was always followed by a dark age. Mm. You didn't get an immediate flip to a new, uh, a new economic structure. You got a dark age. And in fact, <clears throat> prehistory, the people who study prehistory have shown that there's been dark ages for, for thousands of years, you know, that have happened at particular times when one particular kind of structure has, has ended. Mm. Now, the trouble is that that could happen here mm. because there isn't a, a sophisticated and equipped and powerful workers' movement. The collapse of capitalism, as you say, may be inevitable, but it could be fought by a dark age. Mm. Could easily be. I mean, how do you avoid it? They never were able to avoid it in the past because there was no alternative. It had to slowly be found. The alternative organically arose over time. It wasn't a revolution. I guess that the the way it can work though is once those uh, what we we call policeman processes uh, are no longer working, that does create I don't know for want of a better term a sort of possibility space. For new things to happen that couldn't happen when um, when things were being rigorously controlled. So maybe maybe what we might think of as a dark age is actually fertile ground for new things to grow because... Well, let's face it, it should be because there's the history of the working class movement and Karl Marx and all the rest of it. It's not as if we're a feudal serf trying to make sense of the collapse that's happened around them. All the information is 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 out there, you know. It's it's not like it's going to fall out of of memory, um, but maybe it needs to be rediscovered in a new light.
Thank <laughs> you.